You've entered Bookstorm with Kristen Civiletto and me, Chris Storm. This is a podcast devoted to best-selling books that matter, books that make a difference. We're diving down deep with beloved authors about their stories. We're exposing hot-button topics and heartfelt themes, the issues that affect each of us in our own lives as siblings, parents, partners, friends, as human beings. We're braving new ideas, fresh thoughts, hard lessons and important truths. Those kinds of things that stay with us long after we turn the last page and close the book. Well, welcome back Bookstorm followers in 30 countries, almost 50 states, and what are we, 340 cities now? We're so grateful for all of you. Uh, Thank you for writing in. Thank you for your comments. Um, We have something very special for you today. We have Lisa Unger. You know her. She's the New York Times and internationally best-selling author of 20 novels. We're here to talk to her today about a book that is coming out on November 8th that we were thrilled to receive the advanced reader's copy. It's called Secluded Cabin Sleep Six, a wonderful thriller that you're going to enjoy. But Lisa has also written 19 other novels. Her book, Confessions on the 745, is now in development at Netflix, starring Jessica Alba. Wow, Lisa, congratulations. Yay, thank you. (laughs) Yes, uh, she has books published in 32 languages, millions of copies worldwide, and she is regarded as a master of suspense. Kristen and I could not agree more. She's critically acclaimed um, by Best Book. She's been on the Today Show, Good Morning America, Entertainment Weekly, People, Amazon, Goodreads, LA Times, Boston Globe, all agree her writing is fantastic. She's been nominated for or won numerous awards, including the Strand Critics, Audie, Hammett, ITW Thriller, and Goodreads Choice. And this is something very special. Lisa Unger has received two Edgar Award nominations. For our listeners who aren't familiar with this, it is an honor held by very few authors, including Agatha Christie. Lisa's short fiction has been anthologized in the best American mystery and suspense. Her nonfiction has appeared in New York Times, Wall Street Journal, NPR, Travel and Leisure. As if all this isn't enough, I have to add, she is the co-president of the International Thriller Writers Organization. She lives on the west coast of Florida with her family We're thrilled to have her here with us today to talk about Secluded Cabin, Sleep Six. I just like saying it. Thank you for joining us. Thank you for having me. That was such a wonderful introduction. I felt like you were were talking about somebody else, but thank you so much. (laughs) All well-deserved, Lisa. Thank you. I like to give a short summary of your story. And I will not give away any spoilers. So that's a little tricky with this one because this one is thrill, thrill, thrill. And uh, you can add anything at the end that you would like, but I want to just assure you, I will not give away any secrets. Well, what could be more restful than an isolated luxury cabin with spectacular views and a hot tub all in beautiful woods with a gorgeous view? A weekend getaway for three couples is kind of the focus of this book, uh, two of whom are siblings, Hannah and Mako. And they are celebrating Hannah's birthday and a thriving business. In this story, uh, Hannah's brother, Mako, is a founder of a company. And her husband actually works for the company. But her brother is really a generous person, a larger-than-life personality. So they are looking forward to a wonderful time. And uh, as everybody needs some R&R, that's also one of the goals of this trip. So what could go wrong? We have a deadly storm that is brewing. We have a rental host that's a little too present. We have a personal chef that shares with the guests that there may be kind of a scary story associated with the history of this cabin. And the friends here have their own complicated pasts, and some of these secrets run very, very deep. 
Well, these characters begin to question, how well do they know one another? How well does Hannah even know her husband, her brother? And who is the person who is joining them that they don't know? There's somebody that is a new face in the crowd. Mm -hmm. This is a thrill ride a minute. I stayed up very late reading this book and we are so excited. Do you want to add anything to our short summary? I mean, I don't, I don't think of, I can't think of what I could add. That was such a perfect summary, except, you know, we have this, you know, this family, this, this siblings, their, you know, their spouses and, you know, yeah, they've come to this cabin for some, you know, some much needed R and R, but, you know, they're hauling all this baggage with them, you know, in the form of secrets and lies. And, you know, there's a stranger sort of lurking in the shadows, you know, running a dark agenda that, you know, had its has, has its roots in a time before Hannah and Mako were ever born. So it's a, you know, it's definitely, I hope, you know, a book that'll keep you up past your bedtime, turning the pages. Well, we can attest to that because not only that, but Chris and I have actually spent a good deal of time talking about many of the themes underlying the story. So if you're ready to brave the storm, we can dive right in. We are ready. And I have to say to our listeners, I just thoroughly enjoyed every second of this book. It was a rainy day. I read it in a day. I got in a room where I could see the rain, had a little fire going, and you are going to try love this novel. Lisa, thank you for uh, drawing the, us as the reader into this escalating plot, but also into the very hearts of these very relatable characters. Mm -hmm. Family is a major theme in your story. Mako's mother tells him, and I want to quote, family is about actions, mm -hmm. not just biology. We can all relate to this. And as the reader, we can't help but think, you know, we're born into a family. But then it's our responsibility to love and forgive and foster that family. The problem is, this can't be one-sided. It takes all family members to participate in the supposed family. This happens all the time in the real world, this difficulty and in your story, family issues and relationships. And I just had to ask you on behalf of all readers, how did you, how did you find ways for your characters to cope with this notion of family? How do we all in the real world even cope when families fall apart? And they often do. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, family is a theme that has run, you know, it's a, it's a theme that I've explored in a number of my novels, you know. And I think it's probably the thing that, you know, most of us are, are grappling with, you know, it's the thing that we probably have most in common with everybody else we know. And, you know, I think in our culture, there's kind of this, you know, this kind of perfect picture that is bought and sold, you know, especially as the holidays approach, you know, there's like this idea of this like kind of idyllic family gathering, you know, where everyone's gathered around the table and love and support. And there's like all this joy, you know, and then we go home to our own families and like that picture um, is not is not there like that 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 like sort of idyllic sense of family doesn't seem to exist you know or maybe it does in moments or in slivers you know but there's all these other dynamics that occur within families and through generations and you know you see all the kind of seeds of you know sort of unhappiness that kind of you know are planted somewhere down in the family lineage and then kind of you know, progress through the generations, you know, things like addiction and abuse and, you know, who knows what else. And so I feel like exploring those, you know, those dynamics and of course also that, you know, very complicated twist of, you know, of love and anger, you know, that we so often see in our, in our families, especially in our extended families. And then also that moment where as an adult, you choose, you make a different choice, you know, like to not bring something forward into the next generation, you know, I'm going to change this. I'm going to change myself. I'm going to change what comes next. So I'm always very interested in those moments. And in this, in this book, especially, I was really interested in the idea of like, you know, the difference between, you know, what, what makes us a family? Is it this, you know, is it choice? Is it blood? Is it action? Is it biology? you know, and that you have this moment where you meet somebody and you like fall in love with that person, right? You're not related to that person, but you're in love with them enough 
that you decide to get married and have a child. And then you come from this family of origin, but then you become the family of origin for the next generation. And like how much of that is about who you chose to love. And so what does that say about family in general for, you know, for everybody? Mm-hmm. So that was definitely a theme, a deep theme in the book. And, and it's intriguing for all of us because um, you're right. And so then when you marry, now you've adopted your whole spouse's family. Right. And now they're even a, now the plot thickens, so to speak. The plot <laughs> and then and, they're, and then your spouse brings this new perspective to your family. Mm-hmm. You know, all of a sudden the stuff that you, you know, the script that was written for you by your family of origin and the one you play out because you kind of don't know any better until you, until you do. Mm-hmm. Right. And then your, your spouse comes in from outside some this person that you've chosen to build a life with. And he or she is like, well, wait, no, I'm not, I'm not okay with this script and I'm not okay with you playing your role in this script and we have to change it. And so that's a really interesting dynamic that, that comes into play when you get married. It's a huge dynamic. And, and you really showed us that we are stuck with family a lot of times and in your story without giving away spoilers, sometimes people tolerate certain things, maybe yeah. even silence, silently approve certain things because family's actions is a reflection upon ourselves too. Yes. So, and it was very intriguing. Thank you for taking the reader into this very thought provoking idea of family that we can all relate to. Thank yeah. you. Yeah, no doubt. Um, Lisa, the isolated nature of this cabin is very fascinating to me from kind of a metaphorical standpoint as well. Yeah. And sometimes it's only by pulling away from the distractions and pressures of everyday life that we're able to focus on something that we have long been avoiding. Mm -hmm. And here we have some characters who brushed away doubts, who didn't deal with something that has been lurking in the back of their mind for a while. Mm -hmm. And I was wondering if you thought that this family would have confronted these things in the absence of the isolation and the increasing fear. And I was just wondering what you think it is about these kinds of situations, these pressure cooker situations that really force us to confront deep seated emotional issues. Yeah, that's a great question, you know, and it's interesting, you know, this, these, this book was in part um, inspired by some visits to isolated cabins that my family and I took during the, um, during the pandemic. And so a couple of times it was just me and my husband and my daughter, you know, um, but there was also a time when it was with my extended family. And I've had other events like this too, where I've been in an isolated place with my extended family. And, you know, I have found, you know, that, that those trips are very inspirational, (laughs) (laughs) you know, and I, I have always wondered that as well myself, because, you know, as you you know, you grow up, you move away from your family, your parents and your sibling. And then all of a sudden, you know, somebody thinks it's a good idea that you all move back into the same house for a short (laughs) period of time. And so you do that because, you know, again, there's that picture that you're sold where this is like, you know, maybe going to be a good thing, you know, where everyone has like this kind of idyllic, happy time. But instead, you know, you find yourself kind of, you know, I'm not going to use the word trapped, but I'm going to say, (laughs) (laughs) I'm going to say, you know, asked to confront dynamics that you have not had to confront in your daily life for a very long time. Um, So that, so I think that, you know, yes, if you pull yourself away from your day-to-day life and go back into a a close living situation with your extended family, you're definitely going to find yourself forced to confront things that you had buried. It's like, you know, Ram Das says, you know, um, if you think you're enlightened, go spend a weekend with your parents. <laughs> <laughs> and I think that that's something that, you know, is something that I, I have heard and laughed, chuckled about many times in my own life. So it's definitely, you know, that moment where you pull, you pulled away and yeah, you know, there's all these other things in our lives that I think we use to busy addict ourselves into not dealing with some of the core issues for ourselves, for our family. So you can spend your whole life super busy doing all the things that you do to make your career, like in the case of, you know, Mako, or I'm a new mom, like in the case of Hannah, 
you know, or Bruce, who's like kind of in between their dynamic. Like he wants to do his own thing, but he wants to please his wife. And, you know, he's got this professional involvement with Mako. And it's like, I think you can busy dick yourself in your day-to-day life out of dealing with those, those dynamics. But when you're forced into the, you know, close quarters and then not only that, but you're kind of separated out from the things that you use to, you know, anesthetize yourself then yeah, I think there's a, there's a, it's a potential to be a tinderbox and for tempers to flare and for old resentments and secrets to come clawing their way to the surface. Yeah. And you added the additional elements Mm -hmm. of fear and, you know, circumstances changing and shifting and people didn't know what was happening. So it was just an excellent look at uh, forcing people to confront things in a situation that was forcing them to do that it was yeah it's like a crucible right crucible. it's like a crucible that like for it like forces all the fissures and yeah. you know, puts the strain on all the weak places and reveals us you know as who we are yeah that's excellent yeah. Yeah. we should all do that from I time to time thought, i was thinking the same <laughs> or not or <laughs> not <laughs> not to this extent to what ha- what happened here without giving any spoilers but you know if you don't confront it then right. it's like lisa said before you pass it down generation to generation because okay. you just don't want to confront it confronting things makes your life messy for a little while it and that hurt. was a cool lesson to the reader in there i also loved this in the book um in the very first scene in the book talks about ordering dna test kits mm-hmm. here's a hot button topic we've <laughs> all done it it can be terrifying. Do we really want to connect with people we don't know? What if we don't like them? What if we don't want to be like them? Or what if we don't even want to be related to them? DNA test kits are opening up this can of worms today, or maybe some joy for some people. But I loved that you added this element to your story. Can you expand a little uh, about what, you're, what you are feeling about the DNA testing world? And why did you insert this into the story? What was the importance that you were uh, driving at? Yeah, so, I mean, for me, it's always like, you know, there's always like a couple things or like, sometimes it's usually just one thing. But in this case, it was, you know, it was the trips that I took to the ca- to the various rental cabins. But also, a lot of times, I just have an ongoing obsession about a certain topic. And this is usually how a book sort of starts to percolate. I have something that, like, I can't stop thinking about, Right. And, you know, I just do all the research I can do on it and try to find out as much as I can about it. And so that was the case with this DNA testing. Like this is something that has come up for me in the last couple of years, something that I've been really interested in. But I will say that, you know, I have stopped short of doing it myself. I have not taken one of these, you know, sort of consumer DNA tests, you know, and I've, I've had to take them for other, re- like had to take one for another reason for a medical but the, like the consumer, like, you know, sign up for the website, send, you know, spit in a vial, you know, and open the, open the door to whatever it is you don't know about your family. I have not, I have not done that. And it's not just because I, it's not because, um, you know, I don't think it's valuable because I think for some people it can be very valuable. You know, some people do have a deep curiosity about their genealogy. I have a good friend who was like a big, um, a big source for me in, uh, in terms of my research. And she helped me uncover a lot of different things, um, about this area. And so like, I think, and she's like the head of her, like her family, you know, on ancestry.com. And so the information that she's gleaning about where she came from and how she's connected to all these different people, I think is, is fascinating. And I think it's something that we can look at as, you know, as human beings, like, how how tiny 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 an amount of dna that it is that separates us like we share all people all over the world share about 99 percent of the same genetic information it's really just one percent that that tests to tell you that you know you're from this country you're from that country and i find that to be kind of a beautiful thing you know what i mean like under the skin we're all the same, you know, and I, and I love that, that we're like a human family that, that that like nourishes me, that idea. But what I don't love about DNA testing is that, you know, when you spit in that file and you send it off, um, you don't really know what that information is going to be used for. You don't know, unless you've really done the deep reading, 
in the privacy uh, policies of some of these companies, you don't really know what you're saying when you check that box. Yes, I give you the right to analyze my my DNA. And even if there was, you know, strict privacy, it's a little bit of a, a wild west. And even if there were strict policies in place, like companies change, regimes change, you know, and you don't know how this gen this genetic information could be used in the future. So I'm not going to say don't get your DNA tested. Like I'm not, you know, against DNA testing, but I'm just saying do your research before you make that decision, because there's a lot of, there's a great book called The Lost Family by uh, an author named uh, Libby Copeland. And I, you know, it's basically, for me, it was the the major resource material um, for my, you know, when I started my research on DNA testing. And um, it's, you know, it basically the big takeaway is that the chances are high that you're going to find out something that you didn't know about. It could be, like you said, it could be great. It could be a joyful discovery. It could be less than joyful discovery. And, you know, it, it, again, it's another crucible, you know, like the isolated cabin in the storm. It's another place that applies huge amounts of pressure on, you know, your sense of reality and your idea of family and exposes fissures and it shows you very clearly in, with this one, you know, piece of data, what you are, who you are. So you just better be prepared for that before you, where you spit in the vial. <laughs> <laughs> it is a fascinating topic today. And just side note, I did it. Kristen didn't do it for the yeah. exact reasons you just said for both of us. Yeah. Yeah. And it did open a little can of worms in my family. All, all good. But what I loved in your book, I loved that you did say in this book that 99% of the DNA is in common. And I just loved that for all the reasons that you said. Mm -hmm for yeah. connection to people in different yeah. lands and minorities and different languages and skin colors. And I loved that, just that basic, hey, everybody, we are so much more alike than different. Absolutely. I love that. That is one of the things that I find the most nourishing about, you know, some of the research that I, that I did and some of the things that I was able to, you know, sort of find with my friend, the things that I was able to dig out about my own family and without taking the taking the DNA test, because there's all different ways now to just kind of, you know, there's all these places, you know, all over the country and the world that are like clearing houses for all this data, you know, that it is being mined from old newspapers and, you know, all the stuff is becoming digitized. So everything that, you know, things that you might not have had access to before you have access to now. And so, you know, just going down that, like, you know, going down that rabbit hole into to that understanding is very fascinating. But I think that the most fascinating thing is that, you know, when my friend showed me her sort of genetic and um, her report and some of the things that I also saw in my research, it's like, you see all this stuff, it's like, okay, you know, she's 50%, you know, from the UK and, you know, 30% from Scotland or like whatever the, the number breakout is. And then, and then as it goes down, it's like, almost every other region is represented in her DNA down to like the tiniest, most minuscule, like 1%, right? And it's just such a, to me, it's such a, um, you know, a, like a, like a network, like a map of like, you know, how your ancestors traveled throughout continents, you know, over, over history and how, you know, we all sort of, you know, how people meet in like random places and like we were saying before, and they fall in love and they're totally different from totally different cultures, but they fall in love and they have a baby. And now that baby is like of these two cultures. And like that, as I see it is, you know, the beauty of the human condition that we're all, you know, no matter what, love always finds a way, you know, you always like, even you're not supposed to be with this group of people, or you're not supposed to be with that group of people. There's always going to be those two people that are like, I don't care. I love you. And I'm, we're going to make a baby. And I think that's just like the most amazing you know, statement that we can make about, about being human and about, and about loving each other, that, you know, these are the connections that make us not weaker, but stronger. Mm -hmm. Oh, I love that you said that. That's the best love story right there. Right. Thank you. For sure. Okay. Well, I'm going to take that concept in a very dark direction because that's what you do, <laughs> thriller and suspense. Um, but your story did broach the idea of darkness in people 
and yeah. really this idea of nature versus nurture. Uh, you had some characters who wrestled with some very negative feelings and mm -hmm. some of them crossed the line, right? Legally and morally and ethically. Yeah. And again, I'm not going to give away any spoilers, but do you think we all have that potential for evil inside of us? And what do you think keeps some people in check and others not? Do you think that's the nurture aspect? Mm. Yeah, it's so interesting. Again, this is another theme that I've I've really um, dived into in a, a lot of my other novels that sort of, you know, push and pull or tug of war or that intertwining helix of nature and nurture. You know, like, you know, some people think it's nature, some people think it's nurture. Um, but I think now in with modern science and what we know about genetics and what we know about biology, um, like most people believe that it's an impossibly complicated helix of both of those things. So you can have, if you think about something as, you know, something like the MAO uh, knockout gene, which is the gene for violence, right? That is a, a male gene for violence. And the presence of it uh, genetically doesn't, it doesn't mean very much, right? Like you could have that and it doesn't necessarily mean that you're going to be a violent criminal. But if you combine that genetic predisposition with some type of severe childhood trauma or even something as mundane as a head injury in childhood, you could find a different uh, formula taking root in an individual. So it's definitely a twist of nature and nurture. I, I believe that. Uh, I believe that you can you know, have a genetic predisposition for even an illness. And maybe, you know, or maybe even your parents had an illness that you're worried about having, but you can make life choices. Maybe that doesn't completely, you know, doesn't completely mitigate it, but maybe mitigates it enough that you have a healthier and better life than your parents had. So, you know, whether we're talking about emotional or addiction, or, you know, we're talking about biological, I think that, you know, there's a, a combination of nature, nurture, and then of course, choice. So, when I, you know, when I talk about character a lot, I make this, I, I, you know, I take this quote from Meryl Streep, where she says that she thinks that the germ for every, every, uh, every person can be found within every other person. So she thinks that you have access to all the different parts of people just by being human. And it's also like sort of a Buddhist idea as well that you, everybody has within them the seeds for all the things, you know, whether it be heroism or addiction or, um, you know, evil or, you know, saintly goodness, that within us, we have all these seeds and that it's the seeds that get watered that grow. Yeah. And I think if I were going to believe anything, anything definitive about human nature, which I don't think you really can, um, then I believe that, that we are, you know, that we're all, not only are we all connected, we're all similar, but that, you know, we have, we have access to everything that is available in human nature within our DNA. And it's some combination of, you know, nature and nurture choice and just watering, you know, whichever, whichever of these seeds and whatever conditions, you know, are are set forth to water those seeds you know you don't really there's like the choice and then the things that you can't control so i think it's just a really complicated mosaic of an answer that and i don't think there's anything i don't think there's anything easy and maybe there are as many answers to that question as there are people yeah well your answer reflects to the state of our knowledge <laughs> about the subject matter Right? right, because I remember growing up, we used to hear things like, "Well, that's their genes." That's right. It's genes. a bad seed, or exactly. whatever. It's, and, yeah. and that's not going to change. But now, as you pointed out, we know yeah. that it's a much different understanding. We know that genes change now on a minute by minute, second by second basis, that's which right. was a very foreign concept to people maybe forty years ago. And so. we know so much more about the brain because of uh, because of MRI technology. And, you know, we know so much more about things like, you know, um, meditation because of MRI technology and how just the act, simple act of meditating can change your brain, can change the neural pathways in your brain. And that's an important piece of information to realize that your brain is, is neuroplastic. 
that it can change, that even if you've got a groove, you know, dug in, you can work to change that groove. Like even something as simple as like quitting smoking, you know, you've got, you know, these three layers of addiction or whatever you have the, the psychological addiction, you have the physical habitual addiction and you have the chemical addiction, right? That's, you know, the three layers of being addicted to smoking. And like, if you can, you know, find a treatment for your addiction, you know, sort of block that, you know, whatever it is that that's chemical and then work on your behavior and then maybe meditate so that you're asking yourself questions about like, why am I doing this to myself? And look at those, you know, that deep, those deep layers of all that stuff like that, that alone, like that kind of an action alone, it tells us a lot about human beings and, and what they're capable of doing. Yeah. Excellent. For, for both the negative and the positive aspects, as you point out, right? Mm -hmm. This is yeah. incredible. And I love also that you said nature versus nurture. It's so complicated, but in the end, most oftentimes we are left with a choice and a willingness to change. Yes. And, and that, it just gives hope to everyone that yes, this may be in our, as in your story, this may be in our hereditary, mm -hmm. in our lineage, whatever. I don't want to give any spoilers, but we're now aware of it. So what can we do to change it? What can we right. do to stop it? Right. And even this notion of meditation or being in a quiet, relaxing place and mm -hmm. ridding yourself of outside noises and just being able to calmly rejuvenate and recharge is so important today. I love that it you is. said that too, Lisa. It is. Um, can you give us a little uh, glimpse on what you're working on next? What's on your radar? Well, I can't because, you know, I never talk about my, like right now, like I'm just ready to talk about secluded cabin sleep six. Like I just figured out <laughs> <laughs> what I wanted to say about it. And it's been done for over a year. So it takes me that long to kind of get like, you know, because my process is so um, deeply subconscious and, you know, I write without an outline. I don't know what's going to happen day to day. I don't know who's going to turn up. So like, it takes me a while to figure out what I actually wrote, you know, and, uh, and what I want to say about it. So I will say that, you know, I'm in the editorial phase on, you know, next year's book and that, you know, it will probably be dark and, uh, bad things will happen. Um, and I hope that it, you know, keeps you up past your bedtime. Great. It sounds perfect. That's exactly what we want you to come out with. And most authors say the same thing. I can't say. I don't want to say. I, we can't help but ask it, though, because we're so curious. We just want to know. Well, we're going to tell all of our listeners, Secluded Cabin, Sleep Six, get it, read it. You're going to love it. In the meantime, you're going to want to connect with Lisa Unger. You can find her at her website, lisaunger.com. You can find her on Twitter. Facebook and Instagram. And Lisa, it's been an absolute pleasure meeting you and really this great deep dive into a lot of real life issues within a very entertaining, super fun novel that the reader's just going to love. Thanks so much. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for having me. And thanks for such great, thoughtful, deep questions. It's really fun chatting with you guys. I appreciate it. You as well, Lisa. Take care now. Thank you. <laughs> Yes, the six characters in this book who are stuck in this secluded cabin, then a storm hits and they can't get out. And part of the things that I thought of that I didn't have time to ask her is it made you think, uh, how well do we know each other? And how much can we trust our family or friend or spouse? That This book brought out a whole lot of questions about that. Yeah, I think there's things that you don't want to see about someone and you push them to the back of your mind and then there's times where you can't avoid seeing some of those things and really that's what she presented here is that crucible we were talking about but it did make me think about you know how many people in my own life did I push aside or brush aside some concerns because I didn't want to see these problems mm -hmm. and I see that frequently and you know that says something about me clearly but also I think we all have to sometimes sit back and really allow ourselves to explore some of these negative feelings that we're pushing away about someone. Those are red flags. Mm -hmm. What it do is. you think? I agree with you. So that's an, an interesting point. So in this scenario, some of these people in the cabin were friends. Th those are people that maybe you could say, this is a dangerous friendship that I'm in. But some were family. And you're kind of stuck with them, unless you're going to uh, 
separate yourself from that family, which seems to be somewhat trending today, and I'm, I don't think it's a good thing. It, quite honestly, I think maybe some communication is good. But you're right, um, there's a lot of red flags. And it came out in this cabin that they were all in that, that they even were aware of, but they weren't willing to face. So, you know, like I said to Lisa, to, to confront problems in life open is going to open a can of worms now you're looking at it now you have to do something about it yeah. address it but i just love that idea how much can we trust our family and friends that really threw me for a loop um the other thing what else do you think about this dna that was interesting wasn't it yeah i mean that topic i think is going to get bigger and bigger as we are seeing some of the fallout and sometimes positive fallout from some of these choices and, you know, I personally know several families who have experienced this where they didn't know about another portion of their family. It's actually been an incredibly joyful experience for some of them, but it has changed their lives going forward. You cannot go back to not knowing that you have a sibling or somebody else in the family of a very close nature. And what has been really interesting to me is to see some of the similarities in these individuals that never knew one another where they had a very similar, you know, profession, or they have similar, um, you know, gestures that they make. That, to me, is unbelievable, because we do look at this nature versus nurture, nurture and it's clear that there are p impacts from both. Yeah, so. that, but the DNA is so huge in this nature ver versus nurture that to grow up in a whole different family, then two people grow up and they're both, say, um, hair stylists, or they're both doctors, or they're both teachers, that just is so interesting, isn't it? I did the DNA kit. Now, my kids said, don't do it. What if it turns out you have a sister? I'm like, I, I always wished I had a sister. I don't care. Show me who she is. I was all ready. <laughs> I don't have a sister. I'm your sister. No. Okay, thank you. I love it. <laughs> but I did find out, I did have someone in my family claim that my grandfather was their grandfather, and I was open to it. I said, here's my family history. Let's take a look. I did not believe it to be true, but it did open a little bit of can of worms there, and, and it was interesting, very interesting. Absolutely. You know, this book also made me think about this whole nurture aspect, and that is, you know, these watering of the seeds and how important of a responsibility we have as parents. I mean, we already know it's a huge responsibility, but we are creating beings that go out into the world and do good things, maybe bad things. And, you know, we've seen in the news, for example, a lot of examples of young people making some really horrific choices. And I was thinking about the parents. I mean, they must be thinking in their mind, where did we go wrong? What did we do that produced somebody who made such evil choices? Mm -hmm. And that was very sobering to me. Mm -hmm. And I do think, so I have two children. They're very different. I think I raised them in the same way with nurture, but the truth is I probably didn't because they had very different needs. And I did treat them differently. One, they were, they're very different people. They're best friends today, but I did treat them differently. So even in the same family, that can be different. And as you said with these young people today, um, the problem is with nurture, also sometimes there's only so much you can do to change the nature. Sometimes it's unchangeable. And so this is a very deep topic. I also loved uh, her idea that we're all related some way, and my hope is that thousands and millions of years from now, we will be such a compilation of people that we won't say we are one nationality anymore, that maybe we'll all just be interrelated in such a deep way that we're not different like that anymore. Yeah, because that really challenges this idea of identity and some of the identities that we cling to, because will those be an identity, you know, 50 years from now or 100 years from now? Mm -hmm. All great questions. And readers, let me say, we've got deep discussion because that's what we love to do here on Bookstorm. But Secluded Cabin, Sleep Six, it still is a bit of a lighthearted, fun read, too. It's a mystery. There are twists and turns. And I had, I was on all kinds of bunny trails and chasing in different directions. And it's just a lot of fun. So pick up this book by Lisa Unger. Um, Want to give a big old shout out to our incredibly talented sound engineer, Mr. Mark Carey. He's always here. He's busy as can be in the sidelines, and we're just thankful for him. Oh, hope you guys have a good week and enjoyed the show today. See you then.
And readers, we're going to leave you with a few storm predictions to pique your interest because we're very excited about who we have lined up here on Bookstorm. We have Scott Tarot and Suspect, Barbara Kingsolver, Demon Copperhead, Shelby Van Pelt, Remarkably Bright Creatures, Christina McMorris and The Ways We Hide, and Pam Jenoff, Codename Sapphire. Okay, I cannot wait to discuss those books. And I forgot to tell Lisa Unger that my son was in a secluded cabin with friends when I was reading that book, oh and I was my biting my nails. Okay. <laughs> did he get home safely? He did. Okay. In the meantime, listeners, stay on the radar with Bookstorm by visiting our website at bookstormpodcast.com. You can visit us on Facebook, on Instagram, on Twitter, and on TikTok. And if you'd like to see us in person, or better yet, one of our amazing authors, you can see us on YouTube. Just search for Bookstorm and Podcast, and we should come right up. Until next time, one of the best ways to brave the storm is to dive down deep into life-changing fiction.